אוקיי, סאני בונני, דומיילנג, סלאם, שלום, בואנוס דיאס, for our viewers in South Africa and for folks in many other places of the world. Uh, my name is uh, Iskander and I am an uh, activist volunteer with Africa for Palestine. Uh, you are joining us <clears throat> tonight or today for our webinar with uh, Professor Roberto Hernandez on the topic of indigenous Palestinian solidarity. For those of us uh, who may not be familiar with Africa for Palestine, we are a nonprofit organization, NGO, focusing on strengthening African-Palestinian relations and pushing back against apartheid Israel's infiltration and influence into the continent of Africa. We work with solidarity groups, trade unions, political formations, and human rights organizations across the African continent who have our same spirit of progressive internationalism and commitment to standing with other oppressed peoples of the world. Tonight, we are uh, very privileged and honored to have uh, Professor Roberto Hernandez, who is an associate professor at San Diego State University in uh, San Diego, California in the United States. <clears throat> um, and Professor Hernandez is an actively engaged community-based researcher, uh, scholar, teacher and writer. His publications and teaching focus on the intersections of colonial and border violence, the geopolitics of knowledge and cultural production, decolonial political theory, social movements, hemispheric indigeneity, masculinity, and comparative border studies. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor or Profe Hernandez. How are you? Good morning or good evening, wherever it is that uh, you may be tuning in from. Um, greetings from Kumiai territory where I'm located in uh, the San Diego Tijuana border. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Good to see you. Iskander. Same here, Prof. Hernandez. Um, we're very privileged to have you um, as an organization, Africa for Palestine really looks forward to our discussion tonight, but I also personally look forward um, uh, to, 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 uh, to this webinar today. Um, uh, uh, Professor Hernandez and myself uh, work on some, some summer schools together. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure to, to be learning from, from Profe, uh, from Professor Hernandez. So um, if, uh, if we can, let's get started. Uh, with some questions. Uh, so first up, uh, Professor Hernandez, um, our topic tonight is um, Indigenous Palestinian Solidarity. Um, now you are a, a scholar activist uh, coming from um, a Indigenous background, in addition to your, your, your work and your activism focusing um, with that issue and in Palestine Solidarity. Uh, for our viewers, can, can you share with us just a bit more about the scholarly and activist work uh, you do in general and uh, more specifically in relation to Palestine? Yeah, so um, part of how um, it connects, if you will, uh, I'll begin by mentioning just a little bit biographically. Uh, I'm in San Diego, uh, which is, people often refer to San Diego as the San Diego-Tijuana border region. Uh, but more specifically, I grew up in San Isidro, uh, which is really South San Diego. It's as far south as you can get. Um, I don't like the name San Diego Tijuana because San Diego is much larger city, extends to the north, extends to the east. So when I talk about the border, I talk about San Isidro Tijuana. <clears throat> and I grew up in San Isidro, uh, probably about a good 10 blocks from the actual border wall. Uh, so growing up along the along the border wall, constantly uh, dealing with border patrol, uh, not to mention as you know being in, from working class neighborhood, constant police and and so on. Uh, but on top of the police, also border patrol. And uh, being that you know uh, as a Chicano, Mexicano, Indiana, we move across the border to visit family in Mexico a lot. So it's a uh, transborder region, but we're daily faced with the idea of having to cross that border, going through checkpoints, uh, dealing with harassment, 
uh, and since 94 in particular, though it predates, you know, uh, the US-Mexico border increasingly militarized, being a militarized zone. So it's in that context that uh, when, when I was growing up in San Isidro, I, I often point to a massacre that happened just down the street from my house at a McDonald's. And at that massacre, the white supremacist is often spoken of as the first of these many random shootings that now uh, happen so regularly uh, here in the US. If one thing that's good about the whole pandemic is that it stopped some of the mass shootings we we're having regularly. Um, but in that instance, it's considered one of the first ones in 1984. This white supremacist went to McDonald's, told his wife, I'll be back, I'm gonna hunt some Mexicans. Uh, wow. Killed 21, uh, injured another uh, 18. And in, of those killed, it included even some of my childhood friends that, that were there that day. So for me, it began to raise a lot of questions. On the one hand, the border patrol hunting us down, hunting people who look like me down. On the other hand, here you have a civilian quite literally hunting us down. So, uh, so the combination of the growing up, uh, you know, alongside the border wall, the combination of the McDonald's massacre in 84 uh, started uh, raising a lot of questions for me as the young kid about the relationship between the border, the, the, the massacre and so on. Hmm. And by 1992, uh, I was only a teenager, but one of the very first protests I attended was actually against the quincentennial. You know, while Spain, Italy, Portugal were fighting each other over who could properly claim the legacy of Columbus for indigenous peoples, not only in the US, but throughout the Americas, um, there was definitely a lot of movement, a lot of activity, uh, even prior to 92, about what are we gonna do around the quincentennial? There's nothing to celebrate. We, in, instead, how do we, demarcate 500 years of resistance, 500 years of resilience. In San Diego, that took on a protest that did not go to Little Italy, did not go to a local park here that's called Discovery Park, where there's a Columbus statue. Here in San Diego, uh, it was 5,000 people marched on the, on, on the actual U.S.-Mexico border in San Isidro. So this was one of my first protests. And you know, and so for us, it was almost instinctively in our gut, we knew this type of protest, even though there's a Columbus statue down the road, has to happen at the border because everything about nation state borders is in intricately tied uh, to Columbus and the so-called discovery and the colonization that ensues. So, so, that, so we went there, we went to the border, um, like I said, 5,000 people and, and myself at this point, only about 13 years old, but it kind of begins to mark this trajectory, right? I, I'm constantly doing stuff around issues of uh, border violence, not just like physical uh, in an activist sense uh, with the late, lately, the last couple of years with the caravan, we worked here with uh, folks in detention center. So we do um, that migrant rights work, but at the same time, being shaped by the border as my life has been, when I look to Palestine, when I look to, when I look to the checkpoints, when I look to the militarization of occupation, you know, for me, it, it, it was also a no brainer. Like, you know, I stand with those who are being impinged upon by the same border militarization, same violence that is rooted ultimately in a colonial enterprise that is set in motion in 1492, right? I know you and I have talked about, you know, the uh, 1492 is the first Nakba, right? In, in some ways, mm -hmm. right? The, the spiritual manifestation of the attempt to take back Jerusalem is front and center in that moment in 1492 in that city in Granada that we that we both hold so dear, right? So, so I, for me, the parallels uh, obviously different intensities, right? No one here is trying to uh, compare one with the other as if they're equals, so but, but they're, they're forms of violence and genocide that are rooted in the same logics and the same colonial logics. And so for me, it became very natural when doing the work on border violence, you know, this Mexico border, uh, to think not just about this as one side, 
but uh, what some might call comparative border studies and how mm. from the perspective of thinking about coloniality, uh, you know, uh, all these borders are ultimately colonial borders, right? I mean, the way uh, the African continent uh, is, is compartmentalized into these nation state units. You know, we just had the anniversary of the Berlin conference in totally a colonial act, right? And, and the, uh, the uh, area today known as the Middle East or Palestine particular entity known as Israel, this is all this compartmentalization of these, uh, these lines in the sand that when you're flying over a plane, you know, no one can see yet. They're so real and have very real consequences for people. So this is how my scholarly work and my uh, more activist work have kind of come together in terms of uh, quite literally, how do we undo borders? How, how do we create a world not marked by these national territorial borders? Sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Prof. Roberto. I mean, I think that's very helpful uh, for el for us to to help understand how. I mean, literally, you 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 come from a community that uh, I think, as the saying goes, down down there, um, we didn't cross the borders; the borders crossed us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's something that's, that's inspired you to fight for uh, justice in relation to colonialism, um, not only for your community, but, but many other communities, including Palestine. Um, before jumping a bit into some of the history of indigenous struggle and its relationship to Palestinian struggle, I just want to ask two quick questions. Um, if you could possibly just briefly share a little bit of your, your, the activism you've been involved with specifically for Palestine, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have been involved for a while in Palestine solidarity. Um, and uh, for many of us, myself included, um, who are a bit younger, um, we, we're not always aware of, of the history of, of this joint struggle happening, um, you know, before our time. Um, and, and secondly, you have a really, really beautiful background behind you. I mean, it looks very real. So if you could just quickly share with us uh, what, what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, and, and ultimately they're they're related, right? Uh, in the sense that um, the starting point or kind of point of departure of sorts is, is what you mentioned. We didn't cross the borders; the borders crossed us. So that is a very common uh, uh, slogan, if you will, that we we say around here. Myself, I'm currently in Kumia territory, uh, which is not my my peoples. My peoples come from uh, Mexico, from down south, with Arica and Mom, respectively, my mother and my father's side. But the Kumia, uh, where I'm at, quite literally, the original territories extend into far north of San Diego and south of uh, south into Mexico. So the Kumia quite literally got split by the border. You got part of the people on, on the U.S. side and part of the people on the Mexican side now. And if you go up and down the U.S.-Mexico border, U.S.-Canadian border, and for that matter, most national territorial borders, you have original peoples, indigenous peoples who have been split by these borders. So I mentioned, I started with the massacre and, the, and growing up in the border because by the time I went to uh, my undergrad up at Berkeley, you know, it, it was triggering, you know, both research questions that I started to take on uh, as an undergrad even, uh, but also a lot of the activist work. And so um, I was doing a lot of work from, I got to Berkeley fall 97 and so, we started- the, the University of California, Berkeley, that's in Northern California, correct? Yes, so, okay. so I'm in San Diego, but I went up towards San Francisco, Northern California, across the Bay, Oakland, Berkeley, and, when I first got there, you know, I grew, having grown up on the border here, the lines were very drawn, right? It's like you're either brown or you're white. And usually it was border patrols white and they chased brown people, right? But I get to Berkeley and it's a much more uh, diverse, multicultural, all kinds of folks from everywhere, um, you know? And so, you know, we started doing work, not just focused on Chicano indigenous issues, but also a lot of multiracial solidarity work. Uh, and it's in that context that I started meeting a lot of Palestinian comrades, uh, first through what we called uh, the Third World College, where we did this encampment, where uh, it's related to the history of ethnic studies in the US. I'm a professor of Chicana and Chicano studies, and, and sometimes I have to explain how 
And what that means, right, is these, these are departments, Black studies, Chicano studies, ethnic studies, American Indian studies, that came out of struggle, that came out of struggles of the 60s. Uh, and they're not departments that the university just created, gave us top down, but rather that they emerged out of student strikes. And so those strikes at uh, San Francisco State first and then at Berkeley uh, in 68, 69, 70, uh, went by the name of the Third World Liberation Front and the Third World Strike, calling for a Third World College. At San mm -hmm. Francisco State, they got an ethnic college of ethnic studies now. Uh, Berkeley, it's a little bit messier history, but nevertheless, by the 90s, we're still fighting for the college. We had departments, uh, but we didn't have full college status. And so it's in that context that we started doing this third world college. We did a strike and in 99, facing budget cuts for retirements of professors that we're not getting uh, new professors rehired. They're trying to starve out our departments. Uh, we again took on another uh, long strike in TW. We took the name TWF and named ourselves that in 99 um, and took on a protracted struggle that lasted a whole semester uh, culminated in a hunger strike that ultimately led to a victory, partial, but nevertheless a victory, um, where we got eight faculty hires, a uh, new re research center, among other things. But it's in that context that I started engaging with a, a lot of the Palestinian comrades. And, uh, and so the real trigger for me, you know, even though there was more solidarity work, uh, where I, I jumped, you could say, more full in uh, was after 9-11. Immediately mm -hmm. after 9-11, uh, probably within 10 days, I, I believe, if, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, for September 19, September 21, something like that, uh, our campus newspaper uh, published a really racist uh, a statement, cartoon, uh, about you know, the figure, the Muslim terrorist, and so on. And we had a lot of uh, students from Muslim students, the, the MSA and, um, and the beginnings of SSJP that they took over the newspaper offices of our, of our campus. And for many of us that had been working with these folks, uh, they eventually they were told if you don't leave by midnight, we're locked in the building. And at that point it's considered trespassing and you're subject to arrest. For many of us that were present that day, uh, we looked around at each other and we said, we told our, our Muslim relatives, we love you. We're not letting you get, a, get arrested. We'll take this one. And we made it a point to make sure um, because it was so shortly after 9-11, because people were being arrested and disappeared, and we, we, that we didn't know what would happen to them if they were arrested. So we said, we, we got this. And... Um, I believe it was about 21 of us that, that took arrests, but within 10 days after 9 11, uh, in support of these uh, comrades. Uh, oh. So that, that fall 2001, um, after that, you know, I'm, I'm full in with MSA, with uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, the beginnings of what becomes the BDS campaign. And in April of 2002, uh, some might recognize the, the, the day, right? Some uh, anniversary of the massacre at Dar Yassin. Mm -hmm. uh, every year, uh, uh, Palestinian students have been doing a commemoration of the massacre. And it just so happened that in 2002, it coincided with a different calendar, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, and so it became a very contentious compared to previous uh, anniversaries of Dar Yassin, very contentious day uh, in that some of the, the Zionist students on campus uh, tried to uh, discredit and dismiss the massacre of Dar Yassin, saying that the real purpose of that rally and commemoration that day was to, uh, to, to basically counter Holocaust Remembrance Day, that somehow what Students for Justice in Palestine was interested in doing was, was you know, uh, tainting the memory of, 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 of those who were killed at the Holocaust when it had nothing to do with that. It was the annual massacre, annual celebration or commemoration of the massacre of Dar Yassin. Out of this rally, which again, was building up as a very contentious day 
uh, potential arguments that were leading to potential fights with some uh, Zionist students on the on the quad there at Berkeley, the rally ends, marches around campus, and it culminates in a building takeover. I actually am one of the people who stayed behind to make sure there was no fights to calm some of the arguments that were happening. Eventually, I get a call. Um, because I had been involved in a lot of different student organizing, a lot of civil disobedience, I get a call from my sister, who was also a student at Berkeley at the time, and she tells me, hey, man, they just took over the building over here. Uh, they're calling, they're wanting me to call you, see if you could come help give a civil disobedience training. So I wasn't even part of the original occupation, but I went, I joined the occupation, I gave the training, uh, you know, in terms of what to do, what not to do, if you have parole, probation, immigration issues, you know, thank you for your willingness, but we're not gonna let you get arrested. Um, and as I was finishing up this training, I even joke with friends today that, you know, as folks were chanting, hell no, we won't go. I was chanting, hell no, they won't go, right? I was on my way out the door. I did my training, I was getting out of there. But as I was trying to leave, I looked back and there was over 80 people. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was probably one of the first mass arrests post 9-11, aside from the 20 of us previously. It was close to 80 people and a full quarter of the people there, at least a good 20 folks of the people there were all young Chicanas and Chicanos like myself who I had been mentoring. And so hmm. I couldn't leave. I could not leave behind, not, not just you know um, the 80 people as a whole, but more specifically uh, those younger folks that I had been working with for the for previous years. So I decided to stay. And in the end, because of my continued militancy over the previous years, uh, I ended up getting singled out. Hmm. Singled out for uh, additional charges. 79 people were arrested, 78 were cited and released. I was uh, put in a cell uh, facing charges of assault and battery on an officer uh, that, and this dragged out for a year long legal battle. Uh, on, in its own case, my bachelor's was being withheld. I couldn't start a PhD, a bunch of stuff. But at the end of the day, right, it, that was the price one pays for standing up for Palestine. You know? And so it only solidified my conviction to be with my comrades, right? Because ultimately it was like, you know, let's not let this turn into just the legal defense of a few we need to keep the issue of Palestine front and center. And so, so yeah, I think that ultimately is what brought it together. But just to mention briefly, the center behind me mm -hmm. is part of those same struggles in the 60s and 70s, where not only did we take over spaces in the university, but we also took over, uh, this was an abandoned water tower in a large park here in San Diego, Balboa Park. Uh, kind of like the equivalent of a Central Park in New York. And within the complex of the park, um, you know, activists here took over a different building, insisting that our community have a cultural art space within the broader bubble park. Um, of course, a building that was taken over in September of 1970 was a much nicer, bigger building. Um, mm -hmm. But the city said, well, we got this water tank. And as we do, we work with what we got and we converted this water tank into a beautiful cultural uh, art space that to this day is all volunteer run. Uh, I'm one of the current board members. I worked there on, you know, half my time is practically a second job. Um, but it speaks to the fact that for many of us, resistance of uh, political struggle uh, has always been also tied to cultural struggle that the, the very public presentation of our culture in itself, in this context of a white, uh, a white supremacist settler colonial state, the very presence visibility of our culture itself has been an act of resistance. And nowadays, 50 years removed, this year is actually the anniversary. A lot of people sometimes just take art and culture for granted. But for, for colonized peoples, it has been part and parcel of, the, of our struggle, part and parcel of uh, 
of making our presence or visibility known, right? Um, at San Francisco State Ethnic Studies, there was a controversy over a mural, much like the ones you see behind me, because there, uh, GUPS, uh, uh, General Union of uh, Palestinian Students, you know, wanted to put up a mural that depicted, among other people, Edward Said. Right? And there was a big struggle around that at the time when I was also in the Bay Area. Uh, so, in the, you know, in many ways, all these things come full circle to, to struggle, ultimately, you know, resistance. Sure, Professor Hernandez, you've, um, you've shared some, some very um, moving stories um, about your, your commitment to um, the Palestine solidarity struggle um, some very real serious uh, moments in, in, in your activist life. Um, uh, as, as uh, you, know, you had me at a, lot, a loss for words at a moment um, because as, as a Palestinian, I mean, I, I didn't have um, the privilege of, 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 of being with you uh, there that day uh, when you were arrested in, in Berkeley, but I have had the privilege of seeing a picture from that day um, of you getting arrested, um, you know, this, this uh, seeming uh, very brave, courageous activist um, with his hands behind his back, uh, the police behind him, uh, and the shirt I think is kind of ripped off or torn to the side and there's a bit of blood coming from, from the side of your face from being uh, uh, in, in a scuffle, I think, with, with the police or, or during the protest. Um, and you just made, made me think of a very common slo slogan that we hear um, in protests in Palestine, but also everywhere, that there is a Palestine solidarity movement, and it's in Arabic, and it goes, بِالْرُوح بِالْدَّمْ نَفْدِيقَ يَا أَقْصَى بِالْرُوح بِالْدَّمْ نَفْدِيقَ يَا أَقْصَى Which means, by spirit, by blood, we will redeem you, O Aqsa, Masjid al Aqsa in Jerusalem. By spirit, by blood, we will redeem you, O Aqsa, Masjid al Aqsa. Um, so I just, I really want to, to thank you um, for your commitment, uh, comrade, profe, to the struggle for, for your spirit and for your blood. Um, I think it's, it's an inspiration for many of us. Um, if, if I may, just super briefly, um, as beautifully as you put that, those words you just shared, I have to say that that picture was actually from a different arrest. Oh gosh! Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, um, I, you know the, that was during uh, during riots that uh, ensued following the police murder of Oscar Grant in Oakland, California, in, uh, January first of uh, two thousand nine. Um, in which at some point in the midst of the protests after that killing, uh, I, I got grabbed by an officer and thrown into a light post, which is why you have the uh, blood coming down the side and eventually arrested. But in terms of other photos that are out there of the Palestinian uh, protests of April 9, 2002, um, I have to share this story because ultimately the reason why they charged me for assault and battery is that while we were sitting with locked arms um, and police were trying to rip you know, one person from the next and so on, they were using uh, pressure pain holds uh, behind one's ears and the jaw uh, to squeeze, to get people to release their arms and take them. Um, but this, even as we were being you know, gripped with these pain holes, um, we kept our chant strong. And it was in pain that I was still chanting, Viva, Viva, Palestina, Viva, Viva, infita, in, Intifada, that they claimed that what I was doing was really trying to lunge at them and bite them. And I said, Haram, Gosh. I don't need work. <laughs> so the charge itself was oh. that I did officer. When in reality, it was the chanting in the, <laughs> while being you know, subjected to these pain holes that they said I was biting and lunging at them when for us, it was the spirit 
to maintain that spirit strong, even as we were facing arrest in terms of our, our, our stance for um, Palestine. Well, thank you for, for the correction on, on the picture, but, but I think the, the feeling still stands that you have given in spirit and I think in blood to, to, to the cause and we, we deeply appreciate it, uh, Prof. Hernandez. Um, if I can move on to, uh, back to the, the topic for, for today in terms of history, um, over in the USA, uh, most of the country has just celebrated the yearly holiday known as uh, Thanksgiving just a few days ago on Thursday. Uh, this holiday for people who uh, may not know about it um, has been critiqued by indigenous people for its erasure of the genocide and ethnic cleansing um, of indigenous peoples by European um, settlers in what is now called the United States. Can you just briefly share with us, I mean, I know it's difficult, especially as um, a scholar of, of, of this history as well. Can you briefly share with us a history of, um, uh, of the indigenous struggle in the United States? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, part of why uh, Thanksgiving in particular, um, or we refer to it as Thanksgiving or No Thanks Day, right? Um, uh, why it's such a contested holiday it goes back to to this question of culture and symbols right and part of how uh, the U.S. as a settler state manages to effectuate the erasure of indigenous people is to create this narrative of well you know we came and uh, we feasted together everybody was happy and and, and sharing sharing food sharing turkey what have you uh, when the reality is like these are settlers who were starving and practically dying and native peoples received them uh, with open arms, uh, unfortunately to their detriment, you know, because from the East Coast all the way to the, to the Pacific Coast, time and again, settlers would prove themselves settlers, right, and uh, would, would try to uh, take land and kill and maim and, and ultimately erase, but, but the, the, key, the key point is that despite all their efforts, we're still here, right? And it varies from ter territory to territory. Some, some peoples weren't as lucky, right? And had much more of a uh, right uh, genocide. Uh, others uh, fought, rebelled, ran, hid, you know, did whatever they could to maintain their languages or traditions themselves as a people, right? And, and so this is a process uh, of pretty much across the US, right? To varying degrees with different people. Some, some indigenous peoples in, you know, can no longer count on any living peoples, uh, but many others, despite the US narrative, you know, that indigenous people are, are something of the past, right? One of the the founding mythologies um, of the United States is, is quite literally like indigenous people are either dead or dying, meaning mm. they're dead, they're in the past, they're no longer here, or dying, there's so few of them left that it doesn't matter, so it's not a big deal anyways. And so when ethnic studies was created, when American Indian studies was created, um, you know, it was combating one of the main tasks, I would say initial tasks was combating this myth of dead or dying, right? And it's uh, instead demonstrating that, you know, despite violence, despite colonization, despite uh, in some people's cases, losing their languages, losing their traditional territories, uh, we're still here. Right. right, and now that history varies in in Mexico or in other places in Latin America, where instead of the you know what we call in the U.S. as more settler colonial, right, which is to to vanish and replace in Latin America, I would say colonialism plays out differently in that many of the Spanish colonizers uh, integrated much more with native populations. Hmm. Although still maintaining racialized hierarchies of blood and separation and degrees of Spaniardness, degrees of whiteness, and so on, so it's a much more complicated picture. Uh, but you, whether it be the U.S. or America, a lot of indigenous peoples are very mixed nowadays, hmm. 
Uh, but the point is, you know, we're still indigenous peoples, however mixed, you know, Colo uh, colonialism happened. We can't deny that we're mixed peoples, but we're still uh, original peoples, right? Mm. And so I think that's where, where a lot of these uh, things coincide in terms of why the center in the back, uh, but also uh, it gets to to, to a story I'll, I'll share with you, uh, perhaps in some of the other questions around, um, I think I may have mentioned this to you before, when uh, Amira Haas, a respected journalist from Carets, uh, anti-Zionist in her own right, uh, came to San Diego. A, a Jewish-Israeli uh, uh, journalist, correct? Yes, uh, came to San Diego and wanted to find the indigenous people who were in solidarity with Palestine. But, mm -hmm. but I think I'll, I'll get to that a little later, at least in terms of, again, the, going back to uh, Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. right? Uh, long story short, that's why we refer to it as Thanksgiving, right? It's ultimately mm -hmm. the result of these processes of our givingness was the taking of land, right? Now. Sure. No, I think, you know, Prophet, you've, you've shared with us, and, and for those of us who are joining um, this webinar a bit later, uh, we, are, we are here tonight, at least tonight in South Africa, with uh, Professor Roberto Hernandez, who is a scholar activist uh, in, uh, at the University of San Diego, San Diego in the United States. Uh, sorry, University of California. Um, uh, San Diego State University. There's, a, there's three different ones here. San Diego State University. Okay, I haven't been, I haven't been home for a while. <laughs> Uh, San Diego State University in, uh, in the United States, and we are here on the topic of indigenous Palestinian solidarity. Uh, Professor Hernandez has shared with us a good amount about his, uh, his journey in, in indigenous struggle and in solidarity in, in, in the Palestinian solidarity struggle, um, and a bit about the history. Um, in many ways, um, he shared the, the, the kind of broad connections between um, the, the colonization of, of Palestine um, uh, being linked to the colonization of many indigenous peoples all across the Americas and specifically in the United States, um, kind of um, the figure of Columbus uh, sailing the ocean blue in 1492, so to speak, um, and the, uh, the connection, I mean, coming to 1948 with the uh, kind of final colonization of, of Palestine um, and what's known to Palestinians as the Nakba or the, the Great Catastrophe being a type of, of similar Nakba that many indigenous peoples have, have, have experienced in, um, in the Americas and in the United States. Um, but to just go a, a little bit more, more, more specific into this history of, of, of solidarity um, or at least shared points of struggle um, uh, Professor Hernandez, can, can you share with us a bit um, uh, th this history of, of joint struggle between indigenous peoples and Palestinians and or the kind of connections that they just default uh, kind of are always meeting together and, 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 and seem to be fighting similar battles, even though it's not always ex ex explicit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, and I appreciate that you you properly situated uh, in 1948, right? And uh, and what happens following um, not just the creation of, of the entity today known as Israel, but um, more specifically in this, you know, I'm, I'm, despite the white hairs, I'm not that old, so I wasn't there necessarily myself in the 60s. But a lot of uh, uh, a lot of my own mentors and elders have shared stories uh, with me of uh, the 60s more broadly uh, and the yeah. broader, uh, you know, uh, some might say the global revolution of 1968, um, the, the movements that are playing out mm -hmm. even prior to, to, you know, early 60s and so on. But um, 1967 as marking an important turning point that even amongst uh, some colonized peoples in struggle in, in the West, um, there was still this romantic idea from 48 uh, about the kibbutz and the possibility of socialist communes and this emerging territory that obviously is not emerging, there's already people there. But uh, nevertheless, by, by 1967 and, uh, and, and the 67 war, 
uh, all pretensions to any socialist utopia uh, represented by these kibbutz went away. And that the, 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 um, uh, that year really marked a, a, a rift, a turning point in terms of what you could broadly call the US left, uh, in terms of those who in still maintaining the position, a more explicitly Zionist position, and those for whom those pretensions of the possibility of something good happening there went away, right? And so this gets marked uh, as well within the struggles here, not just the African-American struggle, um, but also indigenous struggles and so on, in that, um, you know, um, you get these, the emergence of these soft scientists making apologies uh, or being apologists for, uh, for Israel, but for those who continued their commitments to anti-colonial struggle, the lines were drawn and it was very clear and we stand with Palestinian people. Uh, so 67 um, is what a lot of my, my own elders have really pointed to is making that that division clear for especially a struggle happening uh, from the perspective of the US so far away, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That after 67, you, you, you had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And in the US context, you know, uh, if we look even, even at the history of civil rights movement, there's a lot of talk about black Jewish uh, solidarity, black Jewish coalitions that just mysteriously fell apart following 68. And they blame it on black people becoming more militant and kicking out uh, Jewish folks. But the reality is that that black Jewish solidarity fell apart after the 67 war. And it was because uh, those black that had a more militant radical politics said, we're not gonna deal with you if you're gonna be supporting the settler colonial state that is uh, you know, killing Palestinians. That's where that divide happens, right? And same thing for American Indian movement, you know, who decide following 67 to maintain their, their solidarities with uh, Palestine uh, to the point that even, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, you, uh, American Indian movement had a couple of delegations to Lebanon uh, to meet with, uh, at the time, uh, Yasser Arafat. Uh, uh, Chicano, uh, there was a Chicano delegation in 1984 that met with Arafat in, in Lebanon as well, um, you know, and, and, and because it, again, following 67, those lines were drawn and it was clear where we stood. If we stand on the side uh, uh, of anti-colonialism, uh, then we, we stand on the side of Palestine. Mm. Sure. Okay, um, so it's it's in certain ways the struggles have um, by by way of similar or shared experiences of colonialism. There's kind of a, there's always been a connection by way of similar experiences, kind of a shared enemy. But it's really kind of um, in the mid twentieth century, sixties, seventies, um, in the United States that we see a bit more. Of, of, of kind of recent uh, or more recent history of, of people more explicitly making the links um, and various groups, including groups of, of uh, indigenous peoples in the United States meeting with Palestinians and vice versa. Okay, um, sure, no, this is, this is very helpful um, uh, history, Prof. Hernandez. Um, can you, um, so aside from, um, I mean, focusing on uh, the, the topics we've mentioned before that you, you, you focus on in your research, um, you, you are a, a, a scholar of uh, decolonial studies. Um, and in, in South Africa, um, uh, decolonial studies or decoloniality has become something um, very kind of mainstream. Um, and um, you, you have been involved, very involved in a number of um, summer schools, uh, publications, movements that identify as decolonial. Um, so I just, I kind of wanted to get your, your take, uh, Professor Hernandez, on, on what makes um, indigenous Palestinian solidarity decolonial or not. Um, 
these are long-term struggles. Um, and in, in both cases, I mean, they, they're really ongoing. Um, is there ever a moment where we can say that we, we were fully decolonized? Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll start backwards with that last question and say no. And, and, um, and anyone that claims so, to me would already be a huge red flag, mm. right? And, and, and I say that in the sense that as we started many, you know, many of us started doing a lot of this work. I mean, it predates, it predates these summer schools, obviously, right? We uh, oftentimes we look to uh, someone like I Messer, for example, as a key uh, thinker, Francois Nolan, obviously, but even Cesare before him, uh, as marking what um, you know Nelson Mandela Torres and others have called the decolonial turn, right? Because there's also then the question of anti-colonialism versus uh, decoloniality, um, and sometimes people use them interchangeably. Uh, but but you know I think it's important to demarcate the uh, difference you know between mm. one could be anti-colonial but that doesn't necessarily mean you're decolonial, right? And that's okay, right? But but we need conceptual clarity on these differences because ultimately it speaks to having conceptual clarity on the extent of the problem, mm. right? And so when we talk then, as I was mentioning, you know, the, the delegations, these delegations have continued, my solidarity has uh, continued here in the, in the border every, uh, for the last 15 years, every January, we have a series of events called the Nero Zapatista, uh, which is in honor of the Zapatista indigenous struggle in Southern Mexico. So we have uh, educational events that, uh, that, that both commemorating the anniversary, uh, but also bringing Zapatismo here. What does Zapatismo look like in our context? And one of the events that happens every year as part of Enero Zapatista, or at least for the last five years, uh, had been uh, uh, indigenous uh, Palestinian anti-border 5K. So we would mm. literally go on a 5K run, uh, you know, with, with uh, Kumeyaay elders uh, and runners at the front end, followed by Palestinians with Palestinian flag right behind, and we do a 5K along the border. Um, so so this, there's, this uh, different forms of solidarity have continued through and through. Uh, but part of the question around, you know, whether indigenous Palestinian is, is decolonial or not, I mean, this is, I think, where maybe I should mention about that visit from uh, Amira Haas. Mm. Amira Haas uh, wanted to come to the border because she heard about, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. She heard about indigenous solidarity with Palestinians. So she wanted to come to the border uh, to meet the indigenous people supporting Palestine. And, um, and through mutual colleagues and friends uh, up in uh, San Francisco, uh, they sent her down our way. Uh, so she came uh, to San Diego and was given my number and said, uh, call Roberto, he'll, he'll show you around. Uh, he'll talk to you about these things. Um, but even there, Amira, uh, with all due respect to her, had this very romanticized idea about what or who, who indigenous people are, what they look like, right? And so she thought she was gonna find, you know, people in regalia, like just walking around regalia talking about, you know, solidarity with Palestine. And unfortunately, you know, that's not the case. And, and we had to sit her through, we sat with her for hours over the course of a week, uh, mm. trying to explain to her the history of colonialism as experienced by indigenous peoples in the Americas to get her to understand one, you know, this question of, of uh, mestizaje, ra racial mixture, uh, uh, but also to get her to understand the dynamics that are different, as I was saying earlier, you know, with indigenous peoples in the US versus indigenous people in Mexico and Latin America. Uh, what happens when borders get put up? What happens when the borders literally split the same people in two um, and some are deemed Mexican and others are deemed Native American over here? Um, and, and then what happens when people that are indigenous from Latin America migrate to these territories and become deemed immigrants, right? And not indigenous. 
Um, and all, you know, we literally sat with her for hours, like I said, uh, uh, over the course of a week, trying to get her to understand that in the, the U.S.-Mexico border context, yes, here we're in Kumeyaay territory, uh, but the Chicano indigenous question is also just as pertinent to understand the various dynamics that are at play. Um, and, you know, we took her out to the Kumeyaay reservations and she was surprised that there, you know, um, some, not all of the reservations, some have casinos. And she was just really intrigued by that and couldn't understand, you know, uh, in native casinos. And again, because she came with a particular image in mind of wanting to find these true authentic Indians, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we thought that after all these hours of trying to explain to her how, that history, how it's much more complicated, how we can't talk about indigeneity without talking about borders and mestizaje and all these different dynamics, um, we thought she would get the story better, but ultimately she writes a story in her um, You know, she showed up with a Palestinian friend of hers, Manal, uh, who's a colleague of mine in San Diego State now. Uh, and me and my my then wife uh, walked took her, took her to the actual uh, place where the border wall meets the ocean. Here, uh, sometimes people see these images. There's a U.S. Mexico wall border wall shoots out about a hundred feet into the ocean. So we went to that. <coughs> uh, we walked her there, um, you know, to get a close glimpse of the border and so on. Uh, long, long story short, she writes this article, beautiful article, but it begins with an Israeli, a Palestinian, and two Indians walk along the U.S.-Mexico border. And that's the thing, right? When we talk about ourselves as Chicanos, indigenous, we're indigenous, but we're Chicano, and it's, some, it's, it's indigenous and, and not indigenous, something else. But it speaks to this longer history, mm -hmm. right, in terms of how then do we understand even our ideas about what is indigenous, right? Nobody, if, if, we, if we really think historically, no one is inherently indigenous, right? What happens with colonization is that different people are indigenized. They are deemed only of that territory, fixed to the territory, even in the Americas, part of the land and therefore comparable. Right. So, so I, I tend to speak more about the necessity to think about processes of indigenization and in the case of Chicanos, indigenization and then de-indigenization and being told you're now immigrant, you're not indigenous, uh, and the, the, the work of decolonization then becoming not so much about re-indigenization because even that first indigenization was already a way of separating peoples, multiple peoples, whether it be Kumeyaay, whether it be Wiradika, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Dene, Tonodam, or all these various different peoples, rendering, rendering them into this one generic indigenous category. So mm -hmm. I think we also now have naturalized the idea of indigenous in a racialized way instead of recognizing that it was indigenization as a process. And what we need to be talking about is peoples. What we need to be talking about is the Kumeyaay peoples, the uh, Odom peoples, the Dine people, the Wiradika peoples, right? We're, we're various peoples, we're diverse peoples, um, not just a generic indigenous, right? Because if we, if we only focus on uh, reifying this category of indigenous as natural biological ratio, and we've already accepted one of the foundational myths of colonial and the colonialism. Hmm. Right? So it's a little bit more complicated. And, and ultimately, right, um, just to, to close off on this, is that as we explore and struggle and build further, we're going to have new questions that emerge for us. And if we, if we have to be open to those new questions and we have to keep walking and keep challenging uh, not just power, but challenging even ourselves and our conceptions of self based on these new questions that open up that currently we might not even be seeing. But it's that spirit of openness to those new challenging questions, even of ourselves, that to me is ultimately the, the colonial attitude. 
Because if we don't approach it with openness, if we approach it with static categories, we struggle, we get some victories, we think we achieved an end goal and are now decolonized, then any new question that emerges, whether from others or from ourselves internally, is gonna be seen as not decolonial, but even counter or uh, counter revolutionary, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. This is a, a epistemology of revolution that forecloses continued growth. Once you arrive at the destination, any new challenge, even from within, is no longer seen as growing together, but rather as you are now challenging the revolution, you are counter-revolution and a revolutionary and therefore a problem. So I think we have to think about the decolonial in terms of that ongoing walking, right? As the Zapatistas uh, that I mentioned earlier say, you know, we, we walk in walking while asking questions, right? We can't walk and preach, we have the answer, whether it be uh, you know, the Communist Manifesto or any other uh, presumed answer that's an end all to all questions. No, we're, we don't even know the types of questions that we're, uh, uh, that we're gonna be dealing with in the future. So we have to have uh, an openness even uh, to challenge ourselves. If our insistence is that we are about justice, so people committed to justice, then that openness has to always be there. I, th I think that you've you've raised a really really important point, uh, Professor Hernandez, um, about this idea of of what it means to be indigenous, what it means to be decolonial, what it means to be involved in struggle. Um, I think the way that you framed it is very very crucial um, and important for for all of us committed to this ongoing process. Um, I mean, you, you think of the context of, of Palestine, like, like you were mentioning with um, the Americas, uh, Turtle Island. Um, and it's, when did this thing called Palestine come into existence? Um, and when did this thing called indigenous peoples come into existence? Um, we have to be careful with this question because um, especially in, in relation to the powers that be and the enemy, um, of course, we're Palestinian, we're indigenous. You don't dictate our terms. You can't tell us who we are. You can't tell us uh, who we want to be and what our history is. That's our job and we're complex just as you're complex. Um, but when we do have those moments, when we do have that space amongst each other, um, I think the point that you're getting about, about really kind of questioning what's an authentic indigenous person, what's an authentic Palestinian, what's an authentic decolonial struggle, it's, it's very, very important. Um, this idea of walking, wow. Um, I, I think it's, 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 it's very helpful um, for, for thinking through this, 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 this issue. Um, so, I mean, um, on that point, um, we, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. Um, but I just wanted to, to ask, I mean, we're in, I think a very interesting moment um, in human history broadly, um, in the history of indigenous struggle, Palestinian struggle. Um, there are many kinds of, of, of pressing challenges that, that uh, let's say Palestinians are, are, are facing um, and in relation to apartheid Israel and the countries surrounding them a number of the Arab countries have uh, began to normalize state relations with apartheid Israel. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to get your take on, on what you think are kind of the, the most uh, crucial um, events happening right now, whether positive or negative, successes, victories, um, I mean, the unfortunate forms of normalizations we face, what are some of the more pressing issues that we're facing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it ultimately leads, you know, to this very same um, question of what, what I was just uh, alluding to that, that even a struggle for liberation, if the end goal is whether it be a one state solution or two state solution, is still a state. So why a state? 
right? And why reproduce the very logic of the nation state, the national territorial borders that demarcate, that compartmentalize our mother earth more broadly into these entities, these political juridical um, uh, entities known as nation states. So we run the risk of reproducing, well, again, whether one state or two state, finding a solution only in such a way that reproduces the logic of the problem as a whole, which is the interstate system to begin with, right? Um, and so how might we get creative to not just think of those, those solutions that one might say, well, we have to be practical because nation states is the only way you're legible in this world. Hmm. Well, you know, maybe that's the problem and maybe that's what we need to be tackling, right? And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, thinking in terms of peoples, various peoples and not necessarily states. Because when we look at some of uh, even the Arab states, some of those uh, governments that are normalizing relations with apartheid Israel uh, are not representing the peoples. They're representing their own economic interests. They tend to be a, a political elite, political economic elite, even of a Muslim variety you know, even if of an Arab variety, but nevertheless, there's different interests there. If we, if we spoke in terms of peoples, the various peoples that compose these various different nation states, or even internal to one nation state, then we begin to decenter that logic and, and the power that the state holds. So I'm all for the, the struggle of the Palestinian peoples not necessarily towards a state, but ultimately that's for them to decide. But when it comes to that, that question of, well, towards what end, you know, I think we've tried nation states for at least a couple hundred years and they've proven to only further entrench the problems of coloniality, of global coloniality, right? So I think we, that, that's ultimately what I think uh, the moment calls for, right? If anything, this pandemic has allowed us to take a moment uh, uh, to an extent to step back and reflect on some of these crucial questions. So are we gonna struggle in such a way that only further entrenches the types of divides that got us here to begin with? Or are we gonna start trying to find new avenues out of the, these political uh, dead ends or cul-de-sacs that we're currently in? Cause I think um, ultimately the state is a cul-de-sac. You know, so how might we then start thinking about a uh, revolutionary struggle amongst people, across peoples, between peoples, for the peoples, right? Um, and, and, and this is where I find some very inspiring examples uh, in, in indigenous movements. And here, indigenous, I'll say now this way, in indigenous movements in, in Latin America, uh, and the Zapatistas recently announced they're actually going to travel to Europe, to Africa, to the Middle East, and they want to go and, and make relations and meet with peoples who struggle from below, mm -hmm. whose struggle is for life itself. Uh, and, and to me, these are exciting developments because um, it's really putting in motion what uh, before his death, uh, the founder, one of the two founders of the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton, began writing about what he called intercommunalism. You know, and at the time I've met, I've met older Black Panthers say, you know, we don't know what the hell Huey was talking about when he was talking about intercommunalism. But now, 40, 50 years removed, um, one could argue that what he was trying to sketch out there was this conception of the peoples struggling as people making relations with other peoples in a way that decenters a state, right? Across communities, across peoples. Um, and, and, and in part, some of these indigenous movements are now actualizing that, not in theory, but in their practice, in their way of walking and being in this world making direct, direct relationships as peoples with other peoples. Uh, and I think that to me is, is at, at least for the time being, a way of reconfiguring uh, political struggle in, in ways that do not entrench the very same problems we're trying to uh, move away from. Hmm. Sure. Um...
Well, Professor Hernandez, you've, you've um, definitely left us with some inspiring stories uh, to take forward. Um, I think some challenging questions um, in terms of reflecting our, on, our, on our praxis, on how we engage Palestine solidarity and building solidarity with other peoples around the world. Um, so yeah, we, 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 uh, we've definitely learned a lot tonight. Um, uh, I hope our, our audience has, has soaked in uh, the, the wealth of experience and knowledge that um, Professor Hernandez has, has shared with us tonight. Um, so on, on behalf of Africa for Palestine, we just want to say uh, thank you very much, uh, Profe, mil gracias, shukran um, for, your, for your time, for being with us. Um, and also from me personally, I mean, I always continue to, to learn and, and grow whenever I'm with you. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Profe. And thank you as well for uh, the invitation, the opportunity to share a little bit from from as we would say here from our own our own trinchera, our own little trench of mm -hmm. fighting the, the battles, right? So everyone has their trench, and, and once we realize uh, that all these trenches are ultimately pointing in the same direction, that's where, where inshallah, we we shall win. You're right, Prophet. You're right. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. Be well. Um, and to our viewers, thanks to all for tuning in tonight. Um, you can continue to check out our Facebook page, Africa for Palestine, for more webinars. Uh, we have a number lined up in uh, a number of webinars lined up in the coming weeks. Uh, and to to Palestine, to South Africa, to the indigenous peoples, uh, we leave you with the message of Amandla. Take care, all. Solidarity. <laughs>